How should you understand rationality in economics? If your goal is to understand how people work, how systems work, if your goal is to get the most out of the tool set of economics for understanding the world. And I'm going to give you a definition, I'm going to actually reinterpret a definition that is a common definition used. And this definition is going to be different from the way rationality is used in everyday language. Because a lot of times economists will say rationality in economics means goal seeking, it's about pursuit. And that's basically the case, but I think we can flesh it out a little bit more. So classic definition here is rationality is about pursuing enlightened self-interest. And each of these things is going to mean something different than what you might expect, and especially these last two. So what do we mean by pursuing? Pursuit is about what drives a person, what their purpose is, what they are after. And I love this language because a lion pursues a gazelle. And that tells us it does not have to be deliberative. It can be deliberative, people can deliberately try to pursue one of their goals, but most pursuit in people's lives is coming from the gut. Most pursuit is behavior they're just sort of driven by instinct to do, and oftentimes that instinct is well informed, which gets at our next piece. Pursuing enlightened self-interest, what do we mean by enlightened? So enlightened means that it's informed by a person's experience, the specific context that they as an individual can perceive. It's informed by their gut, and their gut has informed reactions based on past positive and negative experiences, things they uh, are compelled toward, things they are compelled against. And that comes from real information in their past uh, in the past part of their lives, and it comes from whatever knowledge they've accumulated as a person in that specific context from their specific vantage point. So enlightened does not mean all-knowing. That, that's obviously not what it means if we're talking about human behavior. But the word enlightened sort of has this magical element to it. Why are we using the word enlightened? And part of this, I think, is a call to humility. It's a call to recognize that if you as the economist are a system designer and you're thinking about how do we design systems in a way that's optimal, you have to acknowledge that the people inside the systems that you're designing, they have access to experience and knowledge that you do not have access to, and you cannot have access to their full set of relationships context, their full set of knowledge and experiences. So how do you contend with that if you are the system designer? And of course, that's just something that a good economist, a mature economist, is going to have to wrestle with. So I added there that this enlightened part is not fully knowable by an economist. So last, self-interest. What does this mean to a mature economist who is trying to understand other economists? And it does not mean selfish, it does not mean self-seeking, we'll put that over here. What it means is this is driven by a particular vantage point and a particular perspective inside the system. It's not driven by somebody who has a full meta-level perspective of everything that needs to be considered. This person has a place inside the system and drives that are close to them, drives that are a little further away that they're capable of being aware of, and drives that are so outside their experience that that could not be fully considered from their vantage point. So the key words here are vantage point and perspective. It's from somebody's perspective who has a certain group of people they care about, they have in-groups, they have out-groups, they have certain things that are salient to them, that are uh, more prominent in the way they think about the world, they have a particular moral frame that's driving them, that moral frame may weigh some values over other values. This is a particular vantage point, that's what self-interest means here. And another thing about self-interest is that it is in inherently paradoxical, and this is something that you run up against if you watch how this plays out in the real world. Because our brains sometimes try to divide people into being selfish, as in self-interested for themselves, versus altruistic. But most behavior is driven by sort of a care for one's in-group, but that can be at the expense of the out-group. So the same behavior of advocating for your children as a mother where maybe you're advocating that your children get a better spot in the school play than that other mother's child, is that 
self-interested behavior or is that altruistic behavior? And it's really both. It's, it's altruistic towards the woman's children. It's a little bit selfish toward the other children. And of course, any group, any end group, whether it's a political group or a religious group where they're doing something altruistically for the people in that group and um, they're having to act against somebody in another group is both going to be selfish and altruistic at the same time. And then we ask ourselves, can a person be fully altruistic where they're fully weighing every single group in the whole world and every single planetary uh, need in the whole world, they're weighing all of that perfectly? And the answer is probably no. You need to have specific information and knowledge that is unique to an individual community to be able to act on behalf of that community. And so no one individual has a vantage point to fully weigh all of the world's benefits. So the notion of selfish versus altruistic, it's not that we're getting rid of the, the possibility someone can be purely self-seeking. That can definitely happen and does happen. It's just that when we start to define what is an altruistic behavior, it gets a little bit tripped up in the fact that a person can only have one vantage point and they can't fully consider all vantage points, so it's not perfect. So this is how to understand the word rationality if you're trying to use economics to understand the real world and to understand conversations between mature economists. Because it is kind of frustrating for a lot of people that economists use this term in a way that's not the way it's used in everyday language. That's really frustrating. Why would they do that? It makes it seem like we're viewing everybody as being self-seeking. And I think that is a legitimate critique for sure. But then when we're talking across difference and somebody sort of defines it as economists think this, this whole row that, that economists think everybody's all-knowing and selfish, usually if a person is adopting this particular view on how economists think, my perspective on that is that there's something in them, some drive in them that's pursuing something that does not want to understand. And if somebody does not want to understand, usually they succeed at that task. And yet, we can have multiple drives at once that are in conflict. So that's another part of the paradox here is that people have multiple drives in themselves and sometimes one drive wins, sometimes another drive wins. And by looking at their behavior in the real world, we can sort of start to parse out which drive is most likely to drive them in this particular circumstance. And if a person is driven by not understanding, there probably is part of them that doesn't want to understand, but maybe there's a different part of them that does want to understand. So I don't think it's necessarily um, in vain to engage with somebody who doesn't want to understand. But in general, um, this is just this is just one of the dilemmas I think of speaking across difference is that different communities use language differently. And of course, the other thing here is economics language is used in a lot of contexts. It's used in policy contexts. It's used in business contexts. And people will use the language in that context according to their own interests. So they might have different drives when they're in that context and they might shift the definition of rationality to their own purposes in that context. So basically language is like tools. Language as a tool can be used as an instrument to better understand the world. Language can be used as a weapon to try to uh, stop that person who's competing with you. Language can be used as a tool. Language can be used as a shield to stop you from understanding something. So language can be used in a lot of different ways. And what I'm laying out here is if you are interested in using the economics tool set as an instrument to understand the world. You need to be able to understand how other people in the conversation are talking if you want to learn from them. And this definition will help you with both of those tasks.